One of the major contributions of significance made in this work by, by Plato, the Republic, takes place in, in Book 4. And he's dealing with a conception of the human personality. He, he talks in terms of the soul, the psuche in Greek, the word that we get psychology and psyche and all this other psych-related language from. He talks about it as having parts. Now, why is this important? Well, it's not just the notion that we're not a unity unless we do something to attain unity. It's that there's conflict between the different parts of the soul. That human nature might not be fully realized in most people unless we do something to put things into a proper alignment, a proper balance. We're going to talk about that more in the next video. But before we, we worry about what the proper balance is, we have to figure out what's actually going on, what's there. And he's been talking in, in the Republic about the nature of the city and these different classes. We have the two kinds of guardians and then the whole bunch of other people ranging from priests to merchants to smiths to farmers to whoever. And he wants to say, is this, is this going to be helpful for thinking about the human being? So he says, what about the individual? We, we've seen that the state has three classes, and we're looking for justice, and we saw that justice occurs in the state when each of these three classes does its business and does it well. What about the individual? He says, we may assume that the individual has the same three principles in his own soul, which are found in the state. And he may rightly be described in the same terms because he's affected in the same manner. And his interlocutors say, yeah, that sounds right, Socrates. So he says, well, hold on a second. Shouldn't we actually think through whether the soul, in fact, does have these three parts? And how does he do that? Well, he carries out a sort of an analysis about human beings and human nature. Now, he's going to call these, these three parts the rational part of the soul. And this is a very small part. In the, the, just like in the city, the rulers are a pretty small part. And then the spirited or thumotic, it's coming from this Greek word thumos, which can mean anger. It also means you know, sort of a desire for, for competition and glory. Um, the, the part of us that gets riled up, he says. And then the appetitive part, the desirous part that desires certain kinds of things. So he says, um, here's the method. Let's think about this. Must we not acknowledge that in each of us there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state, and from the individual they pass to the state? How else do they, they come there? Take the quality of, of passion or spirit, thumos. It would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality, when it's found in, in states, in societies, in cultures, is not derived from the individual who are supposed to possess it. And here he talks about the Thracians and the Scythians. These are people who are kind of nomadic and, and, you know, barbarians that would get riled up and cause a lot of trouble. And they were known for being great warriors, but that was about as high as they, they went. They, they weren't great thinkers. And then he said, well, what about other cultures? Love of money. Why do people love money? Because you can buy nice stuff with it. You can buy pleasures. You can avoid pains. And so that's found among the Phoenicians and the Egyptians. And there's just typical Greek prejudices against other people as well. And then, you know, the Greeks are in the just right zone. And the Greeks have the love of knowledge, a special characteristic, he says, of, of our part of the world. So in, among the Greeks, you can find the rational part more developed. Now, of course, this is a little ethnocentric, but we don't need to worry about that at this point. The main point that he's trying to make is when we find in societies or cultures or organizations or even in little families that one part, one function of the human being predominates, it's, it's going to be for the organization because in individual people these parts predominate. And now we want to know how does that actually happen and what, what are these parts? So he says... Um, it's not so easy when we proceed to ask whether these three principles are actually three or one. 
Maybe they're just three facets of the personality. Maybe they're just three aspects. Maybe the, everybody's got, you know, all these parts mixed up in them. Maybe they're not even parts. Maybe they're just, when a person acts, you know, uh, ambitiously or in terms of honor or anger, we just say, well, they're spirited. And when a person spends a lot of time thinking, we say they're intellectual. And when they're, you know, seeking out comfort or sex or enjoyment, then we say, oh, they're appetitive. Maybe these aren't really parts. So Socrates is going to engage in a kind of analysis. He says, we want, to, we want to ask whether we learn with one part of our nature, are angry with another, and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our natural appetites, or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action. So the question is, and he's using some, some key ideas here, When we do these things, these are very human things, learning, getting angry, desiring satisfaction, they motivate all of us to some extent. Are we doing so with our entire being, or are we just doing so with one part of ourselves? So this is a, a valid question, and he says, this is not an easy question to, to answer. Let's think about it this way. What would, be, what would have to be the case if we were actually doing these with separate parts. He says, well, the same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways. Now this is what we would call a sort of specific application of the law of non-contradiction, which says that a thing cannot be and not be in the same way at the same time. There's a whole bunch of provisos we can add. Now we're talking about whether something can do something and not do something at the same time. If the soul is doing all these things, then the soul couldn't really be divided against itself. You couldn't predicate, you couldn't say the same things of it. Um, you, can say, you couldn't say opposite things of it at the same time. So, he says, can, a, can the same thing be in rest and in motion at the same time, in the same part? He said, no, that, that can't work. Um, because, you know, even if we think about exceptions where, like, say, a spinning top, right? The, the top is in motion, and yet it's at rest at the same time. You're not, you're not talking about it in the same way. You're not talking about the same parts. So he says, well, how can we figure this out with respect to the soul, the personality, and the actions. He says, um, would you not allow that assent and dissent, that is agreeing to and disagreeing, desire and aversion, aversion, desire is when you pursue something, you, you want something, aversion is when you, 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 get, you go away from it. Attraction and repulsion, these are all opposites, right? So, whether we understand them as active or passive, they're all opposites. So let's think about some really basic things along those lines. The appetitive part, we have, say, thirst. Now what is thirst? Thirst is a desire. A desire for what? A desire to drink something. And he's playing off of two different understandings of thirst that we have. One understanding of thirst could be, you know, we're actually desiring water because we're thirsty, we need a drink. But there's also the thirst that, say, the alcoholic feels in needing a fix of that, that you know, um, alcohol, in this case, the, the particular drug that they, they need. They need that intoxication in order to keep going. Or, you know, somebody might be thirsty for coffee. I'm, I'm you know, an addict when it comes to coffee. Um, I suppose we could speak of thirst in that way. So he says, hunger and thirst, the desires in general, willing and wishing. All of these you would refer to these classes already mentioned. You would say, the soul of him who's desiring is seeking after the object of his desires. Or that he's drawing to himself the thing that he wishes to possess. 
Um, now, what about unwillingness and unlike, dislike, absence of desire? These could be referred to an opposite class of repulsion and rejection. And now let's come back to thirst again. So when you're thirsty, you have some active desire saying, drink that, drink that, drink that. Same thing with hunger. He says, um, you know, let's, let's take the, the class of, of hunger. Hunger is for something to put in your mouth and eat. Now, of course, we distinguish between different kinds of hunger, but he's not going to do that here. So he says, the object of one is food, the object of the other is, is drink. So thirst is, is very simply about drink. It's a desire. And we can do other things as well. You know, we can talk about comfort. We can talk about sexual desire. We can talk about the desire for entertainment. They're all going to come back to the same sort of thing. This is part of the soul that, that has appetites that has desires for pleasures or to avoid pains. So he says, here comes the point. Is not thirst the desire which the soul has of drink, and of drink only? Not of drink qualified by anything else. It's not a warm drink or cold drink or much or little or a drink of any particular sort, but if the thirst be accompanied by heat, then the desire is for cold drink, or if accompanied by cold, then a warm drink, or if the thirst be excessive, then, then you want a lot to drink, and if it's not great, you know, just drink a little bit. Same thing we can say about um, uh, food for hunger. And he worries about an opponent who might say, um, nobody really desires just drink. What they really desire is good drink. Because what it is that we, we seek is, is actually the good. Or we don't desire just food, we desire good food. And he says that's not really what we're going to worry about here. When it comes down to it, we're actually just seeking something to drink. But that's important that we talk about the good. Why? Because that's going to lead us to the point of recognizing a kind of conflict that's going on. So if we, if we begin where Plato is going to begin with just thinking about one part of the soul, the appetitive part, we know that we possess this. How do we know this? Because we have thirst because we have hunger, because we have sexual desire, because we have desire for comfort. And we could, we could talk about all sorts of other desires as well if we want to. We know that we have this. We experience this. This is part of the human condition. So it doesn't take too much for us to, to recognize this part of our soul. Maybe that's all there really is. Maybe all we truly have are desires and aversions. You know, we're different from the other animals in that we have a wider range of desires. You know, it's, it's pretty rare that dogs or slogs or anything like that get addicted to binge-watching Netflix on TV. But human beings can because we have this desirous part, right? And it's very malleable. It's, it's uh, plastic, you might say. We can desire all sorts of things. We can learn to desire things that we had no idea that we had desires for. And then we experience the pleasure and we're like, man, i got to get more of that. So this is something that we have a lot of experiential evidence for. Maybe that's really all that's going on. That's a possibility now, isn't it? So he says, okay, let's think this through. Thirst is relative to drink. But thirst taken alone is neither of much nor little nor good nor bad, nor any particular kind of drink, but just drink only. The soul of the thirsty one, insofar as he's thirsty, desires the satisfaction of that desire, that is to drink something. That's what he yearns and tries to obtain. Now, are there ever cases where we want to drink and we tell ourselves, no, don't do that. 
if that's the case, then there's got to be more going on than just this part of the soul. Because remember what we had as a basic principle. The same thing can't desire or pursue and be against it at the same time. It can't desire and be averse. It can't say yes and say no at the same time. So, what's going on here? This is the passage where he's saying, suppose something which pulls a thirsty soul away from drink. That must be different from the thirsty principle which draws him like a beast to drink. For as we were saying, the same thing cannot at the same time with the same part of itself act in a contrary way about the same. No more can you say that the hands of the archer push and pull the bow at the same time. One hand pushes, and the other hand pulls. Two different principles. So, he says, a man might be thirsty and yet be unwilling to drink. Why? What's going on there? He says, in such a case, what are we to say? Would you not say there is something in the soul bidding a man to drink, the appetitive part, and something else forbidding him, which is other, and stronger than the principle which tells him that? So, what we have here is a restoration, then, of the rational part. The rational part of the soul, it has its own desires and aversions, like it desires to learn, but it also guides. It says no sometimes. Sometimes it even says yes, too. Sometimes it says, I know that you don't want to go out when it's cold uh, and start your car, but if you start your car now, then you'll have a warm car to get into when you have to go to work. That would be the reasonable part of your soul, because the desirous part of your soul is going to say, screw that, lay in bed, it's cold out there, uh, call in sick. So the rational part says no or it says yes, according to what reason bids. It says, the forbidding principle is derived from reason, and that which bids and attracts proceeds from passion and, and disease. So there are two. They differ from each other. The one with which man reasons, or a human being reasons, thinks things out, we call the rational principle. The other with which he or she loves and hungers and thirsts and feels the flutterings of any other desire may be termed the irrational or appetitive, the ally of pleasures and satisfactions. So, good. We've got two different principles. Now we understand what happens when we have a conflict in our soul. Is that the whole story? Now, for some philosophers... That will, in fact, be the whole story. There's just the rational part, and then there's the irrational part. There's thought and feeling, or at least the feeling, the, you know, maybe there's some thoughts associated with feelings, like, man, that looks like a good thing to eat. Plato says no. Plato's interested in, what about the spirited part? Where does that fit in? Maybe it's really just sort of an appendage of the appetitive part. Remember, what is the spirited part about? It's the part of us that gets angry. It's the part of us that desires satisfaction in terms of honor, uh, how other people view us, our, our station. It's the part that has to do with, we might say, self-respect. Maybe that's just part of our appetites, though. Maybe we've got a rational part and an appetitive part, and the appetitive part is larger than we actually thought. Well, let's apply our test, Socrates would say. He, he goes, um, can we assume that it's actually different? He says, let me tell you a story. It's about this guy, Leontius, the son of Aglaon, coming up one day from the Piraeus, which is coming up from the ports, under the north wall on the outside, he observed some dead bodies on the ground at the place of execution. He felt a desire to see them. He had a desire from his appetitive part. Now why? Who knows? This, maybe this guy was kind of freaky. Maybe he was into dead bodies. We don't really know, right? Uh, but he also felt a dread and an abhor abhorrence of them. For a time he struggled. He covered his eyes. At last, the desire got the better of him. And forcing them open, he ran up to the dead bodies, saying, Look, you wretches, take your fill of the fair sight. He's talking to his eyes, of course, in that case. Now, 
What's actually happening here? He's angry at himself. He's not angry at his whole self. He's angry at that part of himself that has those desires for something that he finds disgusting, something abhorrent, something beneath him, something, as the Greeks would say, base or ignoble. And how often have we had that sort of experience? Uh, here would be a great example. Go to a, a all-you-can-eat buffet and tell yourself, I'm only going to eat until I'm full. I'm not going to eat any past that because I'm actually going to try to like have a healthy meal. All you eat buffets are not the place to have a healthy meal. <laughs> Reason would tell you that, right? But your appetites, when you say, we're going to the all you can eat buffet, your appetites are like, sounds great. Let's get there as soon as we can. Because the appetites know that they're going to be working overtime. You know, you'll get a plate and you get your first plate and you're acting with some restraint. Maybe you have a salad first, right? And your appetitive parts are like, it's a good start. Come on, what else we got here? That looks good, and that looks good, and that looks good. Now save some room for the you know three or four desserts as well, because we've got all sorts of desserts. You want to get your money's worth too, don't you? And your rational part is meanwhile saying, now listen, you know, um, I've been looking at the calories, and you're you're past the limit. You should probably back away from the table and uh, you know get your bill and get out of here. It's the spirited part that'll actually say, what the hell is wrong with you? You want, you want to just stuff yourself? Don't you care about how people look at you or how you feel about yourself? Can't you stick to a resolution? This is the part that gets angry. That's why I'm talking in an angry way as opposed to the, the rational part. So the, 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 the spirited part can resist the appetitive part can also resist the reasonable part. What happens when you get angry and somebody tries to tell you that you didn't have good reason to be angry um, and maybe they're actually right? The, the rational part is probably agreeing with them and saying, yeah, I probably should tone it down. But your spirited part is riled up and it, it gets angrier and angrier as a result. So he talks about this a little bit. He says, when, we, uh, when a man's desires prevail over his reason. He reviles, he criticizes himself, and he's angry at the violence within him. And that in this struggle, which is like the struggle of parts of a state, his spirit is on the side of his reason. But for the passionate or spirited element to take part with the desires when reason that uh, take part with the desires when reason that she should not be opposed is the sort of thing which I believe you never observed occurring in yourself nor imagine in, in anyone else. Now that's a little far-fetched because sometimes we, we do get, you know, people point out to us or we point out to ourselves that we're going a little bit too far in our pleasures or desires or, you know, go, you know dating this person or that person and, and we get upset. Our spirited part gets upset. But, you know, he's talking with people that are, have, have good characters already. So he says, Suppose that a man thinks he's done a wrong to another, the nobler, the better character he has, the, the, the less able he is to feel indignant at any suffering, such as hunger or cold or any pain, the sort of things that appeal to the appetitive part, that the injured person may inflict on him. These he deems to be just, and his anger refuses to be excited against them. So if we've got our, our spirited part lined up right, you might say, if it's in good condition, and we offend somebody, and that person takes some money away from us, or doesn't invite us to dinner, we don't get upset with them. We say, I, I've got it coming. Now, on the other hand, he says, when he thinks he's the sufferer of, of the wrong, he boils and chafes and is on the side of what he believes to be justice because he suffers hunger and cold or other pain. He's only the more determined to persevere and conquer. So what, he's, what, what Socrates is saying there is when this part of the soul is actually going after its own desires, desires, say, for satisfaction, for having one's self-respect restored, for honor, or for the, the objects of ambition, it'll mute these things. It'll say, look, I'll put up with that. Great example, think about what happens in, in basic training uh, in the military. It's true that they break you down in order to build you back up, but how they're building you back up from a platonic perspective is they're appealing to this spirited part of your soul. They're trying to produce a sense of camaraderie, a sense of feeling like, in some respect, you're part of an elite, the you know army of one, 
the slogan that's been around forever, right? Um, and what do they do? They make you endure all these things. And then at a certain point, first they make you endure this stuff, and it sucks, and it's awful, and they impose all this exercise on you, and they call you names and things like that. But after a while, you're in an incredible shape, and you've developed the self-discipline to actually be able to follow orders, even though it means going against your own desires for, for pleasures and for avoiding pain. And now you can look at yourself and say, wow, I, I really mastered this stuff. I didn't think I could get through this. I didn't think I could do, you know, 20 push-ups. When I first came here, I couldn't do a single push-up. Now look at me. That's the spirited part being appealed to. Plato doesn't talk about that, but he, he talks about other examples. And so, um, what's the upshot of this? Well, we now realize that the spirited part of the soul is, in fact, its own part, that all three of these parts need to be in proper condition, and that all three of them are distinct from each other. 